everybody. I'm Cassidy, one of your Indianapolis Colts cheerleaders, and you're watching the Believe in Colts podcast. What's going on, Colts Nation? I'm Lawrence Owen. With me, as usual, is my guy, Gerard Powers, and you are watching and or listening to the Believe in Colts podcast. Gerard, this is our, you know, great. We get to come in and talk about and preview the Jaguars game, a game that we haven't went into Jacksonville in like five years and come away with a win. And you said you got to look a little bit at the Jaguars game. Obviously, we watched the the Colts game. I broke down uh, the the Colts passing attack, looked at the all 22 uh, for, for the Colts game. I think it's going to be uh, very fun on this episode to actually break down, kind of preview, see what we're going to, uh, what we're expecting in this game. How have you been so far since we last talked on, on Monday? I've been good. I've been good. Uh, you know, no complaints. I try to, you know, stay positive every day that I'm here. So, uh, no complaints, a lot of football on, a lot of things to watch, a lot of things to do. So, uh, you know, I, I always love this time of the year just because of, you know, football season and so many different levels of football being played, whether it's youth, middle school, high school, college. Uh, it's like every day you got something to watch football wise. So it's always a fun time, a uh, fun time of the year for my household. How's your young family doing in football right now? Oh, we're good. 2-0 and right now. Uh, my middle son, Jagger, his team's 1-0. and And then my oldest son, they're 2-0. and uh, So we're, we're all off to hot starts right now. So hopefully Saturday they can keep it going. Awesome. Awesome. Good to hear. It's, it's always good to have your family doing well so you can stay positive, right? Right. <laughs> all right. So when it comes to Colts fans, though, tying with the Texans week one, that was a bit of a bummer. Uh, in, in all honesty, you got the Texans, as you were talking about, a lot of them are kind of, you know, we tied that's, that's a positive in their note, but for us, it's kind of a bummer. Uh, the fact that we were even tied was, uh, just like, why uh, I don't like ties. Uh, Stefan Gilmore even didn't even realize that, uh, we had a limited overtime. He was ready to go to o double overtime, you know, <laughs> That's the SEC in them. But um, I was disappointed as well until after everybody played in the AFC South. And I was like, hey, well, at least we're still leading the division. So it could always been worse if the other teams that lost end up winning in their of us. But right now, you know, we're tied for first in the division. So, you know, we're still off to a good start. This is where we wanted to be after week one. <laughs> Absolutely. And we have a chance to stay atop the division if we just win in Jacksonville, something the Colts haven't done, as I said, in five years. Uh, before we get started, I just want to remind everyone that Bet Online is the fastest and easiest way to wager on all your favorite sports contests, events with the first to market odds and lines. Find reviews and news in every league, including Major League Baseball, NFL, NBA, NHL, combat sports, esports, even golf. Bet Online continues to be a top online resource for all your sports information from live in game betting, props, and futures. Head to Bet Online today or use your mobile device and make your first sports bet. Use our promo code BELIEVE50, that's B L E A V 5 0, to receive your 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Bet Online, where the game starts. So you got a little bit of a look at the Jacksonville Jaguars, and like I watched it literally finished watching the game uh, about 15 minutes before we started recording. So I got it all fresh in my mind. What did you think about the Jaguars that we're getting ready to face in, in, in that game that you saw? Uh, the game that I watched, the main thing that kind of stood out to me about Jacksonville is just they're young. Uh, they're, they're just young all over the field. So uh, they got some talent, man. They got some guys in some positions that can make some plays, some guys that's very talented. And uh, when you look at them play, you just you can kind of tell the more reps they get, the more game experience they get, that they're going to end up being a very, very good football team. When you watch them versus the commanders, uh, you know, they had the, they had control of that game, you know, at one point. You know, it was an up and down game for both teams, but very competitive. Uh, you know, you got the commanders with one of the best fronts in football. And, uh, you know, so for Jacksonville to kind of handle that, you know, a good defense going against them and Trevor Lawrence, I think he ended up throwing for 270 or so. It wasn't his best game, but, you know, he had the bad pick at the end of the game, uh, but whatnot. But when you see the the guys and the weapons that they have, Christian Kurtz, Zay Jones, 
Uh, you got Travis, um, the running back that got hurt last year, one of their top ETN. ETN, he's coming back. James Robinson's back. Uh, and you look at their production, I mean, uh, I want to say ETN had maybe three, four carries for like 50 yards. And then James Robinson, I think 10, 11 carries for like 66, 70 yards or something like that. So the average per carry is there. They got Christian Kirk going for over 100 yards first game. Zay Jones, I think um, – I think both of those guys had over 20 some targets uh, versus the commander. So it shows you that though they, they got some playmakers. So I think it's definitely going to be a tough challenge. Every time we go to Jacksonville, obviously you said it, you know, I don't know what the spell is or what the hell is wrong with us going to Jacksonville and can't be uh, and can't come out with a win. But I expect another tough game, man. It's going to be a tough game. Obviously, we didn't like how we ended last season. So maybe we're going down there with a little chip on our shoulder or, or some revenge type energy. Uh, but I think it's going to be a tough game. Yeah. I mean, when you talk about how, the way the season ended last year, a lot of the major players on our team wasn't on our team, True. like our quarterback, pass rusher, you know, one of our outside corners, guys like that weren't on the team. Now, one of those guys obviously, you know, knows a little bit about the Jaguars, maybe not the previous team, but he might have – or the, the current team, but he might have a little something to say in this game, and that's Yannick Ngakwe. Mm -hmm. uh, he obviously, there was a, a bad situation, bad taste in a, in a lot of people's mouths in the way uh, that that relationship ended uh, between Jacksonville and the former player for them. Uh, but I, I honestly, man, I looked at this game and I watched the Jaguars and there's, a couple things that I took away from this game on both sides. You talked about the running backs, right? Robinson and Etienne. My my thoughts when I watched them play that game was our linebackers, corner safeties, they butter, tackle well. Oh, my goodness. These boys are shifty. If you miss a tackle, they will make your defense pay. They will yes. make you pay quickly. Uh, very so they, explosive they, too. Very explosive yes. guys. Yes, very, very so. And they're not afraid to use them in the in the passing game and just mm -hmm. dump offs or screen plays or something. So there's always got to be someone there. Hoping Dar Darius Shaquille Leonard will play. Uh, we'll see. Um, he's obviously uh, apparently he was full full participant yesterday, and if he is able to play, that will be a big boost. Uh, another thing that I noticed which is a positive for us. If we can get some pressure on the guy, Trevor Lawrence, when he's under pressure and he feels a little bit, you know, shaky uh, mm -hmm. when it comes to throwing the football, he, his accuracy drops dramatically. There were times when I noticed that he would get pressured or sacked or hit. And the very next play, his pass, whoever he's throwing it to just is way off target. So if, if guys like Yannick Ngakwe or Quiddy Pay or Grover Stewart or DeForest Buckner can get up in there and just, you know, let them know that, hey, we're here. Not necessarily have to get a sack. Just let them know, hey, we're here and we're coming after you. That could pay dividends for the Colts. Definitely. And uh, like you said, Quiddy Pay, I mean, he's off to a hot start. I'm hoping that he can continue to build because we, we all know what DeForest is going to do for us. I mean, every game plan is going to be to stop DeForest. So we can't expect him to make, you know, all the splash plays. But the other guys that on one's opportunity, their one on one opportunity within the game, we expect them to win. And Quiddy Pay is one of those guys that's benefiting right now from just having one on one situations and you know, coming up with some big plays. So hopefully we can get some more pressure. And you're right. I want to say last game, uh, the commanders was able to hit Trevor 10 plus times, 13, 14 times with a few sacks. So uh, hopefully we can continue that because, I, um, you know, if it's Trevor, if it's Matt Ryan, if it's damn Tom Brady, nobody likes pressure on him. Nobody likes getting hit. So, uh, you know, maybe that'll be the key to us getting a victory down in Jacksonville is just putting pressure on Trevor. Thank you for watching Gerard Powers and I here on Believe in Colts, part of the Believe Podcast Network. Don't forget to smash that like button, hit subscribe if you're not subscribed, and tag that notification bell so that you're notified next time we upload a video or go live. And don't forget you can hit that little red share button, help us out a lot with exposure and getting our stuff out to more fans. Now, let's get back to the video. 
Absolutely. Now, the, they did go out to Jacksonville, tried to kind of beef up their offensive line for Trevor and that run game. Uh, they got who I think is probably the second best guard in the NFL. And no, it's not Zach Martin. Uh, uh, you know, Brandon Sheriff is a stud still today. I mean, especially in the run game. He is a people mover. So, and being that he's sitting over there at the right guard position, that's that's where Grove uh, stands, you know. And, you know, that's, that's, a, that's a thing where, he had a really Grove had a really good game last week. Well, I, I would really hope to see him have another game uh, like that this week against Brandon Sheriff because if he's able to to do that, that is going him and DeForest will dictate how well Yannick and Quiddy are able to do on the ends. I think. I agree. No, I totally agree. How those two guys play and how those two guys perform week in week out is going to determine if the outside guys is going to be able to have one-on-one -on -one opportunity opportunities and win their matchups. So I totally agree. And then, you know, coming off of last week, we didn't look the sharpest. We didn't look the greatest. Just kind of looked okay on defense. So you expect everything to kind of look even sharper coming in, coming in this week. So even though we did get some pressure last week, couple sacks and all that, those two sacks kind of came late in the game. I expect pressure and sacks early on in the game, you know, first quarter, second quarter, and not necessarily just in the fourth quarter. So from start to finish, hopefully we can get some pressure on those guys and then our secondary guys will be able to eat because if we're getting pressure, that means the ball coming out quick. And everybody knows when the ball comes out quick, Kenny Moore is at his best. Uh, Stephon Gilmore is at his best. All those guys are at that best when the uh, ball have to come out quick. So. Absolutely. And uh, earlier this week, Gus Bradley, the defensive coordinator for the Colts, uh, talked about, um, you know, uh, moving people in and out. Uh, they were focusing on the defensive line because, you know, our guys had like 80 percent snap percentages. He wants to get that a little bit lower uh, just to keep them fresh. And, yeah. and I, I completely understand that. But something that really was bothering people um when it comes to fans and analysts was guys like Isaiah Rogers had no snaps on, on the defense. Uh, Rodney McLeod had two snaps on defense. Mm -hmm. So that tells you right now that your defensive backs ain't getting a lot of rotation as well. Uh, do you think that defensive backs need that kind of rotation being that they're running a lot? Yeah. But remember we talked about this a couple of pods mm -hmm. ago, as far as when it comes to the secondary, like you train all year to run, like you're, you like, when, when they rank you from best to worst when it comes to your 53-man roster, and when I say best to worst, I will – let's just say best to best. Best to worst kind of sounds like, oh, you're, you suck, you shouldn't be in the game. You made the 53-man roster. You're one of the best in the world. So from best to best, you know, you want your best guys out there at all time. It don't matter who's your backup. If he didn't beat out those other guys, it's a reason why that he didn't at the end of the day. And that's not necessarily a bad thing or, or not necessarily meaning – that Rodney and Isaiah is not going to play in the future. Uh, but I'm sure Gus is going to have certain packages. It's going to be certain matchups versus other teams to where it's going to be like, oh, yeah, he, we got to bring this guy out, bring this guy in for matchup purposes. It's just when we're playing the Texans at the moment, you know, it, it wasn't no other need for secondary guys to get in off of the scheme and the things that they were doing. So once you start getting into the weeks to where we're playing – you know, the four wide receiver set teams, the five wide receiver set teams, the tight ends that look that that's more so wide receivers than actual tight ends. You'll see more DBs start to get into rotation just off of matchup purposes. So when it comes to the D line subbing in and out, we talked about it. You're 300 pounds. We, we can't have you going 87 snaps. We can't have you going, you know, 90 percent of the snaps. So we got to build our depth so those guys can stay fresh because everybody knows in the fourth quarter, you want those guys in the trenches to be fresh as possible because that's when stuff happens. Um, you know, example, Jonathan Taylor kind of starts slow, kind of starts slow. Then all of a sudden, second quarter, big run, third quarter, big run, fourth quarter, every run is five, six, seven yards. That's not because the Texans changed their scheme. No, it's because it's wearing guys, you know, late in the game. So he's right in trying to get the big guys um, a better rotation. But secondary guys – you know, you should be in the best shape of your life. You should be able to run all day. You know, if you get tired, it's it's okay for you to look to the sideline, get a blow for a player too. But a coach is not necessarily trying to save you from that, if that makes sense, when it comes to the secondary. 
Oh yeah, I, I get it. I understand completely. I mean, you're you're out there, you're running all the time. So, uh, you know, you're you're doing it during practice. You're doing it after practice, right? Every I mean, day. you're <laughs> every day. Um, so when it comes to the offense, the Indianapolis Colts right now lead the NFL in total yardage, five hundred seventeen yards from scrimmage, and everybody's mad. And everybody is upset about it, right? Um, and, and we do that with all the mistakes that we had on offense at that, right? I mean, we could have had a lot more. Yep. What are your thoughts about the offense heading into this game? I think, uh, what did you ask me last pod on a scale? I forget what your scale yeah, was. Yeah, the You're worrisome. Like, the yeah. worry, and I said like three. Now, if we look how we look versus Houston versus Jacksonville, it might go to five, six. I'll get a little bit more worried. But, again, when you look at the facts at the end of the game, and the facts are the stats, you know, the eye and the sky, the film and the stats. You know, you try to see if it coincides with one another – or whatnot. So when you look at it, and you're just like, man, like Matt Ryan threw for 350. Like I don't even remember seeing like one deep ball, one, one this. And then you look at his attempts, and it's like, oh, he threw for 50 some attempts. So now you get where all the yards come from, and and then you look at Jonathan Taylor, oh, 30 some carries, 100 and you know, 60 some yards, and all these type of things. So you're like, man, we played kind of bad on offense, and we're still accumulating all these yards and. You know, we just got to turn all these yards into points at the end of the day and sharpen everything else up. Like you said, the drops, the mis the mistakes and all those things. And you're going to see a high powered offense. You're going to see an offense that can score 28, 35 on, uh, uh, every every single week just off of the weapons that we have and the system that we're in. Matt's going to hit the right guy. So if you're open, you're going to get the ball. He's not one of them type quarterbacks that's just going to force feed one or two guys you know it's a system type deal so whoever's open is going to get the ball so i expect that chemistry and everything else to continue to de uh, develop and get better as the weeks go on matt ryan had five pass plays of 20 plus or more yards now the problem with that stat is he did his longest pass play of the game is 28 is that a worry and should that change for this week no nah, not not necessarily a worry um you know, you watch the film and you look how the Texans was defending the deeper routes and things like that. You know, you take what you get. Uh, you take what they're giving you at the end of the day. You know, when the deep shot's there, everybody know Matt Ryan loves the deep ball at the end of the day. So when the deep shot's there, I expect him to take it. But it wouldn't surprise me this week in Jacksonville, we see some, uh, like, I guess, design pass plays to kind of get the ball uh, downfield a little bit more. But I'm not worried about it just because we know Matt Ryan's going to throw the ball downfield anyway. All right. You mentioned it, 31 attempts for Jonathan Taylor. Is that too many? For early on, no. Like, oh, buddy, we've been protecting you all offseason. We ain't let a soul touch you. Like, no, nah, these first couple of weeks, you got to get it. Like, you got to get all of it. And if it if it means we're undefeated, you know, after the first three, four games, I mean, it was worth it at the end of the day. Obviously, you don't want to see Jonathan Taylor banged up or you don't want to see him as the season go on, get wore down. But, hey, everybody feels the best that they're going to feel this season right now. You know, this is the best you're going to feel, you know. Um, so, you know, right now you got to do what you got to do to win. You want to start off fast. I think uh, you look at the statistics, and I remember when we played, um, coaches used to always give us statistics, you know, like, hey, you know, if you start one and two, if you start one and three, these are the percentages of you making the playoffs. These are the percentages of you winning the division and things like that. So um, the first four games of the season is very important as far as just getting your team off and a good start, um, you know, to start the season. So Jonathan Taylor, if we got to give it to you 40 times versus Jacksonville, he's ready to do it. You know, do it at the end of the day. He trains for this. Like he wants the ball. He trains for – 50 carries like if he was at Stanford he would be doing it won't nobody be saying nothing <laughs> <laughs> um I think it was Wisconsin he played Wisconsin for. that's what yeah I that's yeah like red, thought, white, red you know. yeah gotcha <laughs> gotcha well we, we we have a few Stanford guys from the Colts that that have been known so uh and, and, I, I, and I think luck was on my mind a little bit after I saw his interview on the sideline the other day God class yeah. that guy so he yes, was on my mind <laughs> absolutely it's all good man we forgive you uh <laughs> so injury report comes out michael pittman jr nursing a hamstring 
Uh, and of course, Alec Pierce in concussion protocol. Those are two massive hits right now for our wide receiving core. Who needs to step up in this game and fill those uh, voids if these two guys can't go? I'm hoping Pittman's injury is I like I'm hoping like since it like kind of popped up, maybe he was just sore. Uh, because if it was something that happened in the game, I think we would have you know, saw the hamstring, like, oh, man, he pulled his hamstring. He came, like, we would have saw something. So for it to pop up, it might just be like a minor to uh, – that's what I'm hoping in any way. But uh, if – if uh, well, Alec, the situation with Alec, that kind of shocked me, man, to have concussion symptoms after the game and all that. That kind of worried me a little bit. So I hope he's okay. Uh, but if he's not able to go, man, 17, you know, uh, ever since he's came back off his injury uh, this offseason, um, you know, it, it's – for me, anyway, I've, I've always thought that he could help the room out tremendously. You know, if he can just stay healthy, he's another big body. The guy can run. He can catch and do all that. So if Alec is out, you would expect he would be the, the guy that's up on that outside position. And uh, his, his opportunities is about to showcase this weekend. And hopefully he can take advantage of it because we need some guys to kind of step up and help Pittman out and, you know, help, help Matt Ryan out. Absolutely. I think Mike Strawn – uh, should absolutely step in and do that, especially with his size. The fact that he got a couple targets, a big play down the middle of the field uh, late in the game, I think that uh, it, that's someone I'd love to see. Now, with Matt Ryan being here, and we did have a few drops, we did have a few security issues, like you know the where uh, Doolin had the the ball ripped out of his hands at the back of the end zone. Does that you think uh, play a little bit into this? Does, does that like lower Matt Ryan's confidence and lower targets that they might get from him? I would say that after the the first game, but I also said that we won't go cut the kicker after the first game either. So who knows what Matt Ryan is thinking? But traditionally, you know, I mean. These guys, these other guys are in the NFL too. They they're 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 blessed with talents as well. So some plays you can kind of hey, that guy just made a good play. I don't think it's more so of Matt Ryan just losing confidence um uh, in 16 or whatnot, but I do think he's more of a slot guy kind of anyway. So that fits his mode. So I don't think his reps are changed or his opportunities are changed. But with Alec being, you know, the opposite side, bigger guy, I figure 17 can kind of Strong can kind of move over and feel that role a little bit better if uh, if Alex is not able to go. But I, I I don't think Matt's lost any confidence in his guys. I'm pretty sure right now he's throwing a pass and they're talking about some talking as we speak. He's he's getting these boys ready to play. So I think the offense is going to open up a little bit more uh, this week far as within the passing game. So I think a lot of guys are kind of get their opportunities to show what they can do and, um, you know, in their roles for the season couple guys on the defensive front for the Jacksonville Jaguars had pretty big games uh, against the Washington Commanders. Josh Allen, who I have been singing praises about since he's came into the league, the pass rusher for them. And then, of course, the number one overall pick, Trayvon Walker, uh, wow. also had a, had a heck. I think he's the first guy since uh, T.J. Watt that had a sack and an interception in his opening game, right? Uh, yeah. So wow, he looked good. How important is it going to be for Matt Ryan and the Colts offensive line to always keep an eye on both those guys? I mean, you got to. I mean, it's going to be very important. And, again, Matt Ryan, he's going to get the ball out quick. You know, he's one of those guys that, you know, he can sense pressure. He can get rid of it. He can make the right checks, might right reads and all those things. But as far as our O-line, I think we, we had 10 quarterback hits last week, 11 quarterback hits with a couple sacks as well. So I think it's a lot of things we need to clean up in the O-line front, you know, to get ready for these guys. I mean, these guys are young with a lot of energy, and they're trying to prove a point. And, they, and you know, so far in these guys' career, you know, they've owned the coach when it came to them coming to, to Jacksonville. So their thought process might be a little different compared to other teams that play the coach that, you know, we get all this respect from. They might be looking at it like, no, we're better than this team. Like, we've always beaten this team. So their mindsets is, you know, that young, I just want to play on Sunday. I don't care if I'm hurt. You know, they got this this young team that kind of just figuring it out as they go. So uh, it kind of worries me a little bit. So hopefully that our O-line, you know, can sure up some things from last week because, I mean, Jacksonville definitely got a talented defense and a, uh, for sure talented 
uh, DeLon. Besides the two names that I gave off uh, on the defense, is there another another guy over there that you look at and go, that guy might be a problem for our offense? No, nah, for me, it's uh, the defensive coordinator that they hired, Mike Caldwell. Um, he coached me in Arizona. He was the linebackers coach. Uh, you know, he's, he come from under Ty Bowles' system with the Jets uh, and then going over to, there to Tampa. So for him to come in and instill this new 3-4 hybrid defense with the kind of guys that he got on defense, I mean, you look at their height and weight across the board when it comes to that front seven, man, they're huge. They're long, they're fast, and all that. So he is the one that kind of worries me because he understands. Like when I say Todd Bowles is one of the greatest defensive minds I've ever come across and probably one of the best defensive coaches in football uh, to this day. So that kind of worries me a little bit as Jacksonville got the right coaching uh, in place because for years it's always been like, man, they just don't got the right coaches, the right people, the right, you know, this or that. Now it seems like they got a pretty good head coach, pretty good OC, and now a damn good DC. So uh, they're going to look real structured here uh, quickly. Speaking of head, uh, speaking of coaching, the two head coaches going up against each other know each other incredibly yes. well, incredibly yes. well, as we know that uh, Peterson was the head coach of the Philadelphia Eagles while Frank Reich was over there as his offensive coordinator. Um, will that play a part in this game? Do you think you know them knowing each other a little bit is going to dictate how how this game plays out? It's a little chess in that, you know, it's a little little chess moves and, oh, I know what Frank is thinking or, oh, I know what Doug is thinking in this moment or that moment. So that's what makes the matchup kind of fun because these guys can kind of go at it from their brains, I guess. But at that same token, all these coaches know each other. I mean, these guys spend a lot of time together in the offseason. They've been on a lot of stat, different staffs together from coming up from GAs to just working their way up. So a bunch of these coaches are familiar with one another. But uh, like you said, Doug and, and Frank probably got a closer relationship than most coaches. So it'll be kind of fun to see that matchup. I definitely think that plays a part in, in Sunday's game as well, just knowing how each other think. Awesome. This channel is proudly sponsored by the Backroom Collection. They do beautiful sports canvas art with football, basketball, baseball, and other sports themes. Special orders are accepted and autograph pieces are available. Many Indianapolis Colts sign pieces will be available beginning in November. Just use your discount code CL10 to purchase the pieces you want to spice up your living area. That's CL10. So... I'm going to put you on the spot here. Uh, this is this is always a fun part of, of of this podcast, and 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 you're welcome to to put me on the spot at any time you want as well. Uh, Frank Reich, there's a lot of people who consider him a top ten quarterback or top ten coach in the NFL, and then there's a lot of people that consider you know, hey, we need to get rid of Frank Reich because he's an awful play caller and blah blah blah. Now. I'm just curious, where would you rank Frank Reich in the hierarchy of head coaches in the NFL right now? Uh, honestly, I would probably put him right in the middle of the pack. And the reason why I say middle of the pack is when we're talking top 10 head coaches, you've done something as a head coach. And I don't mean as an assistant. I don't mean as a intern or anything like that. Like, no, you've been a head coach. You've won Super Bowls. You've gotten to the playoffs like whatever the case may be. So it will be hard for me to put him top 10-ish when there's so many head coaches that have accomplished so much uh, with being a head coach. But do I think he's a damn good coach just like those other guys? Yes, I do. Uh, but just don't think he has the resume to be in that top 10 discussion. That's just my opinion. All right. Well, this is that year he, he has the opportunity right now. We are undefeated. Um, that's about the only thing good I could say about week one. Uh, <laughs> but you know what's cool about Coach Wright is when I was in Indy, he was the quarterback coach. Mm -hmm. And how he is now as a head coach is exactly how he was as an assistant. Kind of mild-mannered, uh, not really a yeller, um, but you know when he's serious. You know when he's getting this point across. He's going to dot every I, cross every T. He's going to over-prepare. You know, he was he was the exact same way as a quarterback coach, seeing him in the rooms with Peyton, seeing him give giving the defense, you know, uh, certain advice, certain tips on when quarterbacks do certain things. So, 
of me knowing Frank, you know, from my time when I was in Indy and he was just a quarterback coach. And I remember I was kind of happy to meet him just off. I was like, hey, man, I was watching NFL films and you're the backup quarterback that was for the Bills that had the, the comeback game. That's how my conversation, our relationship started when I met, we met Coach Wright. I brought that up. So to see him now, it's kind of cool to see that, you know, he hasn't changed you know, who he is as a person and who he is as a coach. You know, he just took it to a whole nother level. Yeah, last night I was doing a Patreon stream and we was just hanging out, you know, talking to guys and uh, fans, followers, stuff like that. And a lot of people say that, you know, Frank Reich is a, a player's coach. He's, he's the Mr. Nice Guy. He never gets angry with anyone. He's not like Coach JB, right? Uh, <laughs> from Last Chance U. Look, uh, my only defense was that to that was, well, we know what he's like during game day. We know what he's like, you know, during interviews. None of us has been in the locker room with the dude. Uh, what is he like, you know, to players? Is is he a guy that is nice to players and just puts everything on himself or, or what? See, you I hate when fans say like, oh, he's a nice guy. He don't do this or he don't do this. He's a player's coach. I mean, he's a former player. So, obviously, he understands everything that the players are going through. I'm talking everything. So, that makes him a player's coach. And that don't mean – and it's other coaches that might be I, – I, I guess that might express themselves even more, like far as being the yeller or the loud talker. But they're a player. They're a former player. So, they, they're player coaches as well. But what gets me what people – have a knock on coach Reich about his I guess his personality let it because it's so mild to us is uh you know nobody was saying that about Tony Dungy nobody was saying it about coach Caldwell you know and those guys had a bunch of success in the league and you know these these assistant coach coach Reich all these guys they come from under that tree you know they come from under working for Tony Dungy working for Jim Caldwell to where even though their approach was a little different, it still got the job done at the end of the day. So I don't necessarily think it's fair to Coach Wright that people give him a hard time about, oh, he's nice to guys. Like, just because he's mild-mannered don't mean he's nice to everyone. You know, and, and we're talking, this is a business. You know, nobody's expecting to be treated nicely anyway. You have a job to do. You get you get graded off your job. You get, you know, you know all those type of things. It comes to if you're doing your job or not at the end of the day. He can be nice to you all you want and cut you at the end of the day, if you're not doing your job, you know, th this is how these guys feed their families. I know it's a game to us as a fan. I know that, you know, we kind of take it from granted, but these guys, this is how they feed their family from the owner to GM to coaches to players to the cooks to everybody in that building. They're doing this for a living. So it's, it's um, I don't want to say it's disrespectful, but I think us as fans have to give them a little bit more respect in their approach. They're not doing they're doing everything that they can possible to win on Sunday. You know, whether you agree with it or not, they're in their eyes, they're doing what's best for the organization and best for the team. And if we can kind of get behind that in a sense, and I ain't saying you have to agree with everything, but just get behind the, the fact that I know these coaches are trying to make the best decision that they can to win a game. I think it'll help us as fans on game day to kind of understand certain decisions being made and certain – uh, situations when it comes to, you know, the guys going out there and performing well. That's, that's a great inside answer. And here's, here's the thing you, you, you said, you know, you can still be cut at the end of the day. He's still going to do his job. Yeah. Go, go, go tell blank and ship how nice of a guy Frank Reich right. is, you right. know? Uh, so that, that is what it is. And also, you also got to think, just because he might be a nice guy doesn't mean that every all the coaches that he surrounds himself with that you know like position coaches and stuff are nice guys. Look, Tony Dungy was a, a as you said was a very nice guy, but we all know there was a bunch of you know position coaches on there that uh, for for that Colts team with Tony Dungy that weren't exactly over there you know constantly. Uh, I don't know, cheerleading their guys. <laughs> yeah, I get exactly what you're saying. Yeah. So as a as a so Coach Rice position, he's not gonna change who he is as a person or who he is as a coach just because now I'm a head coach, I'm supposed to act a certain way. Like, no, you got the job off of who you've been this entire time. So there's no need to change. And uh, and I think we're gonna see success with it. We know this formula works, you know, it's just a matter of us 
putting this thing together and uh, making sure them boys go out there on Sunday and performing like they, they, they should perform. But we got the players. You know, I mean, I don't know if fans thinking that if we had a mean coach, we'll be playing better. Then we'll probably have some players that's hating, hating to be a part of the team and, you know, and all these other things. So, uh, I mean, it's a yin and a yang at the end of the day. Some people going to like it and some people going to love it. Uh, you're, some people going to hate it. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, I, I utterly agree with you. And, and you know what? No style of coaching is perfect for every player, right? Exactly. Uh, what, uh, being a Mr. Nice guy might be perfect for player A, player B, but you might need that tough love coaching, uh, which is the best way I can put it, right. uh, for, you know, player C, player D. Just curious, what style of coach best affected you? Uh, not to boast or brag, but I kind of could adapt to anybody. I didn't like the, the a-hole coaches that used to be a-holes for just no reason. Like as soon as you walk in the door, they're just being an a-hole. <laughs> I used to hate those type of coaches, but I respected it if you was an a-hole every day. So if you came to work every day and you was an a-hole, I know how to act. I know how to, you know, uh, adjust accordingly. But if you come in and you're an a-hole one day, then the next day you're all giddy, giddy, happy. And then the next day you're an a-hole again. It used to just, from the mental aspect, it used to just throw me off a little bit because I didn't know what to expect going into work. But uh, for me personally, best coach I had, Todd Bowles, uh, as far as in the NFL defensively, and he never raised his voice one time. You know, and I, literally not one time he never, like, got out of character to where he was pissed off enough to where you were going to get a vein poking out his neck from him <laughs> yelling. He was a soft-spoken guy that knew how to get his point across. Like, we knew when he was pissed off. We knew when he was happy. We knew when he was getting his point across or whatever uh, the case may be. At the end of the day, coaching, when it comes to coaches, their job is to be it, – it has to be to teach every player its, its responsibility through the fullest, that they know – like it's very transparent on what your job is and what you got to do. So if you got to yell at a guy to do that, which some players react better to yelling, that's what you got to do. If you got to talk kind of – soft spoken to some guys and you know that he's going to get the job done if you just tell him that's what you got to do so the best coaches i had is the ones that's able to adjust to the players that they had in the room but personality wise ty Bowles, he never he never raised his voice not one time while i was in the nfl now my best coach in college will muschamp you know he broke every dry race board that's probably ever made on the sideline <laughs> with yelling and cursing and all that type of stuff so you know, the, my favorite two coaches, they're totally opposite from one another, but they both worked for me at the end of the day. I can just see that Patriots meme of of, of the uh, with the iPad just wow. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Oh man. Well, I think we're come to the getting getting near the end of this one. Uh let's go ahead and do some predictions for the game. Uh what do you expect the outcome for this? Sunday's Jacksonville hosting Indianapolis Colts going to be? I'm going to say 31-17 Colts. Hmm. I think that was what my score was last week. Last week, yeah. I'm yeah. going to say 31-17. I think the offense is going to move, like, be more, like, we're going to move the ball a lot more. I think we're going to score when we get in the red zone this time. I think we're going to look sharp on offense. So, 31 points, 35 points, however you want to look at it. But defensively, I think that we're going to look a little bit you know, better than we did last week, maybe get a couple of turnovers here or there. And I think we can hold Jacksonville to 17 points or less. Now, obviously this is, uh, I, I think this is going to be dependent upon whether or not Michael Pittman Jr. plays. Um, Cause sure. I mean, he is a massive part of our offense when it comes to the passing game and running game. Cause let's, let's face it. The man can block in the run game too. Yeah, that's true. Um, I, I'm going to raise you a little. I think the Colts come out and make this a statement game. Uh, I think a lot of the mistakes are going to be cured up. You're not going to see one botched snap this game. I I promise you. I promise you. If, if they do, I need to find Matt Ryan and 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 Ryan Kelly's phone number and give them a call myself. All right. <laughs> um, I say the Colts score 38 points in this game. All right. That's a lot of points. That's a lot of points. And defensively, I'm hoping for a few turnovers since we didn't get none last week. If if uh, Shaquille plays, uh, that boosts the chances quite a bit. Um, I'm 
I'm looking. I, I like I like where you're sitting at the 17. I think the yeah. 17 is a fair number for the Jacksonville Jaguars. So I got 38 17. Cool. I like it. All right, man. Uh, normally, I don't call out massive blowouts like that. That's a 21 point blowout, but uh, we need that as fans. In, in, in all honesty, uh, I think that would be good for the Colts as a team as well, just to to, to get last week behind them and uh, get a, a solid win to move on, especially against week three. Obviously, yeah. we want 1-0 and this week. They're not looking forward to Kansas City, but, I mean, come on, guys. A, a lot of us are. Uh, <laughs> Hands off for sure, but the coach, they there's no way they're looking past Jacksonville after no. what Jacksonville and done for done to them. So no, no way. All right. Uh thanks so much. Any final words before we get out of here, Gerard? Nah, that's it, my man. All right. Well, that will be it for this episode of Believe in Colts brought to you by Bet Online. I'm Lawrence Owen. That's Gerard Powers. And as usual, go Colts. Do you believe? 